Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Marianne Fusco, and I co-chair the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking's Outreach Committee. I'd like to thank the coalition's executive director, Kate Lee, for organizing tonight's panel on predatory alienation and the role it plays in human trafficking. I'd also like to thank Gina Cavallo, coordinator of the coalition Survivor Leader Advisory Council, for inviting the lived experience experts we'll be hearing from tonight. I came to the coalition through my volunteer work with New Jersey Safe and Sound, which since 2012 has been educating the public about predatory alienation and extreme undue influence and advocating for laws against such destructive behavior, behavior that often lies at the root of domestic violence, gang recruitment, financial scams, and yes, human trafficking. Those efforts resulted in the unanimous passage of a New Jersey state law that defined predatory alienation and ordered a study of its effect on young adults and senior citizens. That study was conducted by the Rutgers University School of Social Work in 2017. If you'd like to read the full report or the executive summary, we'll be providing links to both those documents in a follow-up email after tonight's presentation. So what is predatory alienation? In the New Jersey law calling for a study of it, predatory alienation was defined as a person's extreme undue influence on or coercive persuasion or psychologically damaging of another person that results in physical or emotional harm or the loss of the financial assets, disrupts a parent-child relationship, leads to a deceptive or exploitative relationship, or isolates the person from family and friends. In other words, predatory alienation is the purposeful disruption of an existing relationship, often through the use of deception, in order to isolate an individual who's not being abused or otherwise in danger from the people that they trust, all for the purpose of exploiting, controlling, or taking advantage of that individual. Now, when a person breaks ties with family and friends and outside them, I think, oh, they're going through growing pains or they're estranged. But estrangement, when people have a hard time getting along, is not the same thing as alienation, when someone is purposely being turned away from their loved ones by a third party. In an estrangement, the person does not want to have anything to do with their family for realistic, rational reasons. For example, every time I visit my father, he gets drunk and hits me, so I've stopped dealing with him. In an alienation, the person has unjustified, irrational, or illogical beliefs or fears about their family and friends that have been instilled by the manipulators who are trying to destroy a healthy relationship to suit their own purposes. In the majority of cases I've personally heard about throughout the country and abroad, the targets that were preyed upon came from stable homes and were not considered at risk. In those households, loving, well-adjusted teenagers and young adults were turned against their own friends and relatives by an outside influence, incited to leave home, to give up their favorite activities, sever all relationships, and submit to the control of a predator. According to the US Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics and the National Center for Victims, uh, Victims of Crimes, those ages 16 to 24 experience the highest rate of relationship violence. Yet under current law, families have limited rights to intervene, even in the case of a 16-year-old being alienated. To date, there is still no law to protect us from predatory alienation. So until then, it's essential that we learn how to recognize it and avoid it, and to share that information with those we care about. I'm going to ask our tech support to put up the New Jersey Safe and Sound Spectrum of Influence chart. Now, as you can see, there are various degrees of social influence. In the green column, we have ethical in influence. It's influence that nurtures your independence, respects your other relationships and interests, encourages access to information, and leaves you in control of your choices. In the amber column, those are the early signs of mind hacking. That's what we like to call what happens when a, pred when a predator short circuits your ability to think critically, to think for yourself. So mind hacking disregards your personal boundaries, pressures your thoughts, feelings, and behavior, begins to isolate you, and leaves you feeling confused. In the red column, we have undue influence, which fuels fears, controls your time, and keeps you isolated from others, demands unquestioning commitment, and leaves you obligated to get permission before making any decisions. A survivor of human trafficking once told me that while she was being trafficked as a college student far away from home, she felt as though she were in a mind lock. Those are the words she used, mind lock. She knew she needed to run away from her abuser, but she was afraid to and didn't know how. 
Now I'm gonna turn over the discussion to Bill Goldberg so he can address how such a thing can happen. Bill is a certified psychoanalyst and licensed clinical social worker in private practice in Englewood, New Jersey. He has more than 40 years of experience treating people who've been manipulated by destructive individuals and groups. He also teaches in the social work and social sciences departments of Dominican College in Blauvelt, New York, and is a columnist and frequent presenter for the International Cultic Studies Association. I'm delighted Bill could join us tonight to share his expertise. Bill. Thank you, Marianne. When I think about the issues that today's podcast will consider, predatory alienation, human trafficking, cultic abuse, and domestic violence, et cetera, I recognize that all of these issues are somewhat different, but they do have a unifying theme. The victims are induced to assume a childlike, self-destructive dependent stance with respect to a predator who uses and exploits them. One of the commonalities of these situations is that the victim, while they're being controlled, doesn't recognize that they have choices because these choices have been systematically destroyed by the abuser. People make the best choices at any given time out of the options that they can see being available to them. When someone who has been manipulated to assume a childlike dependency on another person, who is either a sociopath or a gaslighter or both, they don't realize that they have choices. It's common in all of these situations, for example, for the victim to be cut off from family and resources that would want to help them. The families that I work with who have members in cults um, have been have their family members alienated from them by telling them that they don't have anyone that's really looking out for them other than the cult leader. Their family, their former friends, helpful agencies and groups want to control them and harm them. The perpetrator is the only one who recognizes how this dynamic operates and has the strength to help them to not succumb. An explanation of exactly how this distortion of reality is accomplished is different in each case, of course, but it always involves isolating the victim and reducing them to that childlike dependency. When you look at a cult leader or a pimp or a domestic abuser, they present themselves as powerful controllers. Domestic abusers, for example, might demand to know where their partner has been. They might scrutinize their partner's phones they demand an accounting for every minute. Cult leaders, because they have a direct and unique relationship with God or with the truth with a capital T, demand that no other thoughts other than those that they've approved enter the victim's mind. Those other thoughts are denigrated as satanic, bourgeoisie, sinful, disloyal, nonsensical, irrational, or egotistical. At first, the victim is love bombed and made to feel special. They've finally found the perfect person who will help them. Once they've committed to the relationship, the perpetrator convinces them that they're flawed and that they receive the supposed gift of membership in the group or relationship, not because of their innate value as a human being, but because of the perpetrator's generosity. The victim chases the love bombing feeling because the leader has become a source of both comfort and humiliation, and because those feelings are conflated in the victim's mind. What we call a trauma bond is formed. Uh, and initially, the brain rewards the victim with good feeling chemicals. But when they're out of, flay, out of, out of favor, uh, with the uh, uh, perpetrator, the victim feels pain. That's why it's almost, almost always takes many, many attempts before a victim of domestic abuse is able to leave the exploitive relationship. It's like a physical withdrawal. When former victims are able to leave these controlling relationships, they realize that the all-powerful leader is in reality an infant 
who can't tolerate the thought that their victims would leave them. They therefore use bullying tactics to get them to stay and obey. A person who's secure in himself or herself does not need to control others. And these are the examples that we're going to hear from the other panelists as we go on for the podcast. So I look forward to hearing uh, from my uh, fellow panelists. Thank you, Bill, for that insightful overview. Um, as you mentioned in the next segment of tonight's program, we're gonna be hearing from three lived experience experts who broaden our understanding of predatory alienation, the tactics employed in it, and offer their unique insights into the various ways that people can be isolated and ultimately controlled. First up, we have Wendy Barnes. Uh, Wendy is the Human Trafficking Response Program Coordinator for a California-based healthcare system, a speaker and consultant to many organizations, including Homeland Security's Blue Campaign. Wendy uses her own experiences as a survivor of child sexual abuse, human trafficking, and intimate partner violence to educate and empower audiences in the fight against exploitation. She's also the author of a memoir, And Life Continues, Sex Trafficking and My Journey to Freedom. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Um, gosh, Bill, that opening described my life almost to the T. I, I, I can't tell you how comforting it is to know that others understand this. You understand this. Um, so just a little bit of a background. I was trafficked for about 13 years. I met my trafficker when I was 15 years old. And our traffic, the, the trafficking ring that he developed consists, you typically had about four to 10 young girls, young women or girls under his control. I know in my situation, how he got me into the position of being able, you know, of course, first it was the love. I love you. We're going to live happily ever after. I'm going to get you away from your family who does not love you. Um, and he convinced me that the only way that we would live happily ever after is for me to run away from home and move into a shelter with our um, newborn baby. Once there, that is when the trafficking started. However, over that 13 years, he would use different techniques um, for each of the victims he controlled um, to alienate them from their families and friends. However, the one aspect I wanna share is that if you had asked me back then, does, does your boyfriend not allow you to go see your mom or your friends? I would have said, no, I mean, I would have said, yes, he does. He, he or, sorry, I got it mixed up. He allowed me to go see, I would say, can I go see my mom? Can we go out for lunch? Sure, go ahead. But upon my return there, I would start getting interrogated. What did you talk about? What did you eat? How much time did you spend with her? Where did you go? He would start um, treating me just really horribly, um, be very angry with me. So the same thing with, you know, my friends, if a friend, you know, if I happen to, you know, meet up with somebody and they ask me, hey, can you go out to dinner? I'd ask them, hey, can I go out to dinner with this person? Sure, go ahead. But upon my return, the torture would begin. And so it was really me, I felt that it was me, you know, cause after a while, my mom would say, hey, can we go out to dinner? No, you know, I, I don't wanna see you. And he made it to where I thought that this was my decision to keep myself away from other, you know, from family and friends. Um, so yeah, so I'll go ahead and turn it back on over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, for your candid um, description of, of, of your experience of being coercively controlled. Um, we're going to move on now to um, our next speaker, um, Rita. 
She um, is a survivor of sex trafficking, but now also an educator. Uh, Rita O'Brien um, is an educator on the subject in the very communities from which she was trafficked. Having earned a master's degree in social work with a focus on trauma, Rita serves on the board of Pearls of Great Price, which is a coalition in southeastern Michigan that works to fight human trafficking through education and advocacy. Rita also is on the board of the Kalamazoo, Michigan area anti-trafficking coalition. And in addition, she holds the rank of major in the Volunteer Civil Air Patrol, which is part of the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. Welcome, Rita. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Bill. And thank you, Wendy. So my experience uh, was from three to 13. And I survived because I wanted to survive. I mean, I wanted to be able to live. So I, my trafficking was with a secret society and a cult um, that was related to a church. And uh, my predator trafficked dozens of children, different schools, different buildings, different areas. And it was most, mostly sexual type um, things we had to do because we something was put in our drinks. Um, McDonald's shakes, I always got them warm. To me, a McDonald's shake should be frozen. So there was always something in the straw. And after a while, I learned not to um, drink the shakes. And then there was something put in the hard candies to make us sleep. So my best friend from fourth grade was trafficked with me um, in the town I'm worked at. <laughs> and um, we started to put the pieces together like a few years back that we were trafficked, sex trafficked um, all over West Michigan. So uh, and lots of kids, we never saw the same kid twice. So my predator had to have known that if we saw the same kid at school or at a youth group or something, we might put the pieces together. So he, he pretty well planned to keep us isolated so we wouldn't see the same kid. And then if I did not perform sexual acts or do what I was told, I would get electrocuted with a horse fence. So I learned to just get it over with so I could go back and do something else. My predator told me it was my fault and it's what God made me for, which I don't believe that now. I've gotten lots of good therapy, but I, it breaks my heart when we think of young children that get sucked into this or anybody that gets sucked into sex trafficking or labor trafficking. And um, I also ended up having eating disorders because I wasn't given food until I performed and did certain sex acts or whatever I was told to do. So my experiences just make me want to fight this till I die. So we can ask questions, I can answer questions later, but I want to thank you, Bill and, and Mary, uh, for being on here and helping us educate others. Thank you, Rita. We appreciate um, your candor as well. Um, our next lived experience expert comes to us from Colorado. Emily Robinson is policy coordinator at the Avery Center for Research and Services, which shares its sex trafficking research to reduce the demand for commercial sex to convict traffickers and to decrease the barriers to services for marginalized populations. Emily has previously consulted to such organizations as Polaris, Dress Member, I'm sorry, Dress Member, Roller Skate to Liberate, and Survivor Alliance. As a lived experience expert in cult and labor trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, Emily focuses on research and program evaluation to help reduce client harm and increase trauma-informed organizational health. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Marianne. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. You know, it is a very difficult topic that we're talking about. I just want to acknowledge that. And for me, my perspective is coming from a lived experience of cult labor and familial trafficking. I was trafficked by my family starting very young through my early adolescence. So for me, when I'm thinking about the concept of predatory alienation, it's a little different. Uh, this statute talks about that uh, an alienator will disrupt a parent-child relationship or leading to a deceptive or exploitive relationship and causing isolation and control through that. But when your family member is the alienator, is the one who is controlling your world, it is a little different perspective when you don't have that loving, safe family. And so what I'm wanting to talk about and bring tonight is talking about, well, your caretakers are the ones who shape your world and they're the ones who define the world for you. 
They tell you your worth and your value. They tell you how the world works. So when you have a family member who is trafficking you, they are alienating you in effect from any other form of information in the world. They are defining everything for you about how the world works. So in a sense, then when children are like in these environments, like I was, I didn't know anything else except that. And that's where that alienation and that isolation and that brainwashing really took place for me. And part of the concept of looking at like other experiences with relationships that are like third party outside of the family, it's so important that we address how to create protection and to recognize those alienating relationships. But I want us to also think about what does it look like to take this law and this concept and look at it closer to home? Uh, there was a study that was done by the Trafficking in Persons Department in 2017, where they estimated that 41% of child trafficking experiences were actually familial trafficking. So I just wanna leave that there with it as we continue our discussion and just thank all of my fellow panelists for being here and everyone and thank you for allowing me to be here. No, thank you, Emily, for, for that uh, um, broad, adding that broader dimension to tonight's topic, because as we're gonna see, there are various uh, points to consider as we, as, we, as we raise this issue tonight. Um, at this point, um, now that we've heard these very personal examples of the many and diverse ways predatory alienation can be manifested, the question to consider is how can we objectively determine whether something actually is going wrong, whether someone is actually being unduly influenced, alienated, or coercively controlled? So to answer that, we're very fortunate to have with us tonight Alan Shefflin, Professor Emeritus of Santa Clara University School of Law, a specialist in law and psychiatry. Alan has been judicially recognized in federal and state courts as an expert on mind and behavior control, suggestion and suggestibility, memory and hypnosis. A resident of New Jersey, he continues to, to consult on matters of undue influence and is a member of the board of, the, uh, board of Directors of the International Cultic Studies Association. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, listening to those stories brings me back in time uh, to an experience that I had in, in court. Um, I was asked to be an expert in a case of a woman who uh, married, very young, married uh, her husband, had four, four daughters, and um, the husband became um, uh, impressed with a cult leader in, they lived in Texas, the cult leader was in California. Um, the cult leader told them that as each of the daughters uh, reached maturity, they should be sent to him so he could deflower them. And the case was, what can we do about it in court? The mother did not want to testify against the cult leader because she was still part of the cult. Um, we attempted to argue all we had at the time, which was brainwashing. And the judge said not only would he not consider um, a brainwashing defense because it's nowhere in the law, but he wouldn't even be briefed on the subject. And that infuriated me. And so I sought to find a way to get uh, people into court who had the right to tell their stories, put it before a jury, and let a jury decide. Um, to cut to the quick, uh, I'm still working on that, but I did come up with something I call a social influence model. The social influence model uh, has two purposes. One is to serve as a vehicle to, per to persuade juries um, using just the facts about why this was really uh, predatory uh, and why it was undue influence. The second is to you for each individual victim 
to use the social influence model as a way of journaling, of continuing to write your life story, but also begin to see how you could turn it into a weapon uh, in protection of other people. The social influence model is 10 words. Uh, there are six components, um, and it comes from a poem from um, Rudyard Kipling, who said, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were what and why and when and how and where and who. And I learned that journalists are taught this to tell a good story and a complete story. So here, here we go. Uh, item one is influencer. The influence, influencer is the person who's the predator. And that's the who. And it's, it also is the identity and status. You identify this is the person and this is the status the person had, which helped lead to the ability to influence you. Second is the influencer's motives. This is the why. And the motives are usually monetary and um, you know, self-congratulation and power. Three, the influencer's methods. This is the what and the how. The methods um, are techniques. Some of you have actually described some and talked about them. But this can be this can be journaled and this could be presented in common ordinary language uh, to juries. Um, the circumstances uh, of number four, where or uh, when or uh, when um, this is what happened factually as you describe the stories. The fifth is the influencee's uh, receptivity and vulnerability. Some people are more easily persuaded. Some people um, are more loving and giving, and they don't see the trap that awaits them. Um, some people are very suggestible. Some people are not. You can measure these things, and you can also write about them. And the final one, number six, are the consequences. The what? Where were you then and where are you now? What has happened? What has the result of your experience been for you? And rather than talk to juries about a lot of a lot of theories, and this is completely practical. It's ordinary language. It somebody on the jury in each individual will relate to what you say about these elements. And so it's 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 persuasive, which is its its purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, insightful explanation, Alan. It would be wonderful if we could get legislators to to use that as a tool to to bring it into play. Uh, so much is being said these days about coercive control. Um, there are efforts to um, have statutes uh, that include it. As part of the definition of domestic violence, some states, Connecticut, New York, no, not Connecticut, Hawaii, and uh, California have already done so. There's talk of doing the same in New Jersey. But how do we get it outside? How do we get the concept of course of control beyond domestic violence? Because it could be an outside influence, it could be a family influence, it could be a gang recruitment. There are lots of many, there are many ways in which people are coercively controlled and made to do what they would normally have thought is unthinkable. Well, there was a, um, and still is in law, a tort, a civil wrong called intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, it is well known, is well recognized, it exists in every state. Um, and it, the, basic, the basic concept of um, intentional infliction of emotional distress is you can't treat people that way. So it has to be a line in the sand drawn. There has to be a line, and that that crosses the line. I have no problem arguing that everything we are talking about crosses the line. The challenge is to get 
uh, legis uh, to get a judge or uh, willing to 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 take the case, and and we're we're really getting ahead. I mean, we're talking about remedies when right now what we really need to understand better is the phenomenon. And I'd like to go back to the other panelists for a moment and ask them, Bill, and also the lived experience um, experts, warning signs. How did you know, um, uh, particularly you, Wendy, because you were you were a little older at the time that you were starting to be um, alienated. Did you get a queasy feeling? Did you did you suspect anything might be off, or or were you just so enthralled with this person that that you didn't see what maybe you now can't see? Yeah, I don't think I saw it because you know because of my childhood, you know, I was sexually abused when I was a child, and I think throughout my life prior. I perceive the world that, you know, my gut feeling isn't right. What I think isn't right. I'm always wrong. And so this was already implanted in me. So when my trafficker came along, because he first showed love, attention, caring, compassion, those are all things that I had never experienced in my life. So when this came along, I think that overpowered. So anytime there was this, this doesn't seem right, you know, because I guess there were times that I knew that something wasn't right, but I, I heard one of you say, I think it was Bill about the almost, it's almost like an addiction, you know, you get away from them and it's almost painful, but when you're with them, you know, everything, everything's okay. And so, Bill mentioned that, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No. Bill mentioned the term love bombing, which you've just pretty much described. Bill, how do you know, how can you tell when someone's just being nice and when you're being love bombed? It's, it's, it's hard to draw the line. Uh, we, you know, Alan pointed out that we have to look at the vulnerability of the individual as well as the actions of the perpetrator. And in the beginning, uh, the, the perpetrator does present something that the victim feels they've wanted all their life, you know, this loving person. Now, all of us have that, that desire. All of us would like to uh, return to a fairy tale, return to, to find a fairy tale kind of world but as children we you know we uh, there is that view that fairy tales come true people live happily ever after you're you 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 uh, you you marry the person you love and there's bluebirds around and we all carry that kind of um view of the world in us even though we're mature and we recognize it's not true what uh the uh perpetrators uh, are able to do is to evoke those feelings in people and the, the, the feelings that maybe this is the, that perfect world that I'm looking for. Love bombing is the technique that's used to make the person feel special, but trauma bonding is what happens chemically in the brain when uh, a person alternates between being very uh, kind and loving and very vicious and demanding. And it's confusing to our, our brains. And it creates paradoxically a, a, a bonding to the person because you want so much to have that love. And when you're not with the person or, or, or out of favor, or the person is, is uh, uh, questioning you about, um, you know, why did you have to go to visit your mother? Or what did she do? And how, you know, how was that? Uh, how did she harm you? Um, it's confusing, and the um, the the chemical that's uh, that's released when you're feeling bonded with the individual is denied you, and that can be painful. And it is very much like an addiction. So, to um, the point of Rita, I think you had mentioned uh, being previously when we previously spoke about um, you witnessing. Uh, the people that were uh, abusing you and alienating you prof 
form to use those same tactics on other children, other people. Um, how did you experience that, knowing what was being done? What, what was your witness to that and, and what was your reaction to that? Well, wow. The first thing that comes to mind for me was uh, basically I taught the other children how to disassociate. I told them to fake sleep to get through what was happening to them because I couldn't protect them. There was so many children and so many people there. I couldn't protect them all. And I knew they'd make us eat the food, which was going to make us sleep. And I couldn't remove the food, you know, so I, I taught the other children how to fake sleep just to get through the horrible things that were happening. I'm just it's it's just terrifying the the experience that you had. Uh, um, Emily, in your case, were there ever feelings that you could escape, that you could get out of the situation? Um, how did you cope? Uh, I would second dissociation. <laughs> it's a very powerful tool that our minds have when you are trapped in situations that you really don't see any ways of escaping, especially when we're talking about like the family structure and the trafficking I experienced in my family, they use the, your basic needs for attachment mm -hmm. against you. And they use it to build loyalty and commitment to the family, to the system. And it creates this, split inside of you basically between the self that's in normal life and the self that's having to do these things mm -hmm. that you don't want to do and so like someone like me I can still be going to school appear completely normal and functional and at the same time all of these horrific things are happening in my life so it becomes a mess there <laughs> internally you know, we, we focus on the relationship between the predator and the target, um, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of collateral damage that happens as well, because that target is a person and that person previously to the abuse or the control had contacts with people. And there are people that cared about that person. So there are other victims. These are secondary victims, people that care about the person being preyed upon. Um, who maybe lose someone and can't break through. Does anyone want to speak to the challenges that those people face, friends or family members of someone? Rita, did you want to? Yeah, so my grandfather saw what the predator was doing to me. So my grandfather learned how to outsmart him and he would make my predator think he was abusing me. He'd yell at me and throw things at me. But when we got inside, he would love me and hold me. So my grandfather knew my predator was doing awful things. But back in the 70s and 80s, nobody did anything. And my predator was pretty powerful in his secret society. So I got to see love in a weird way. And I look back now and think, oh, my gosh, my grandfather knew. So he played like he was violent because he knew my predator liked violence. Mm -hmm. But he loved me. <laughs> Wendy, how about you? Did do you want to speak to that issue of the collateral damage to these uh, predatory relationships? Yeah, I mean, I just, I think of, you know, even though, you know, and I always say this, you know, my mother and father, they both loved me dearly, but they did not have the tools. They were not emotionally capable <laughs> of, you know, raising children. And I know that my mother, especially, I mean, she, she stalked me for the entire 13 years, trying to find me, trying to pull me out, trying to do all this stuff and, you know, trying to make me safe and even trying to get into my head. But the thing is, I think he was so powerful. It overrid anything she said. But, you know, I just, I look back now at all of the things that my mother and my friends, you know, very few friends, you know, went through when they saw there is this predator after my child. But I have to tell you, at first, when they when when my trafficker was first introduced, everybody loved him. Ever he was very charming. Nobody would believe that he would do something like that. And so these traffickers, 
the predators, they are master manipulators. You know, the one thing I tell people, a lot of people want to go, well, why didn't you leave? Or why, why is this happening? Or why did you allow this? But no, let's just look at the fact. Predators are master manipulators. They are very good at what they do. And so, um, yeah. So, and I think that there was this break of, oh my gosh, I, I liked this guy. You know, my mom, I liked him. You know, my friends, yeah, we liked him. We thought he was good. And then when everything starts coming out, um, so yeah, it's it kind of lost on that question. I'll pass it over. <laughs> well, you you made some excellent points. So so Bill, let me ask you then: Are there specific do's and don'ts um, for people to respond in this kind of situation, or or if a family finds that they're being attacked by a predator who's claiming that? their danger to their own child and this predator is trying to alienate them. Um, what should the response be? E each situation obviously is different. And, and of course that's 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 always the case. I know of in in the uh, 50 plus years that I've been working in this field, I've had a couple instances where um, a family member or a loved one has confronted the individual and said, look at what's going on. You're in a cult of relationship. You've got to get yourself out. And it worked. That's a couple out of maybe a, a thousand yeah. um, families. Usually it doesn't work. Usually um, the individual who's in the throes of, of this um, uh, alienation uh, uh, has been inured to the family uh, 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 trying to, you know, to tell them what's going on. So what you've got to be is, is much more subtle if you can be, which is to ask questions. Um, that's, I'm, I'm glad that you're happy. I want you to be happy. Tell me more about your happiness. For instance, do you sleep well at night? Or do you sometimes have difficulty sleeping? Do you, when you look at um, the love that you're getting from your partner, your guru, your uh, leader, or, or whatever, um, do you feel that they love you for who you are or for what you give them? And you've got to ask the question in such a way that you're, um, you're, you're ignorant. I want to know. I'm less interested. And what the individual responds, which will always be, they love me unconditionally. You know, it, it, that, that's what they're, they'll say. I'm less interested in the response they give than for the moment, they're going to have to think about that. And sometime later, um, Wendy talked about having doubts uh, as, as she was going through this. And just about everyone that I've ever worked with has told me that they had doubts when they were involved in these relationships, times that they said, there's something wrong here. There's something that's not fitting, but they learned to, dis to, to dissociate. Um, you know, Rita said, you know, you, you just, you pretend you're sleeping. You, 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 you get yourself out of the situation. Dissociation was a defense that all of you learned when you were young to, get yourself out of a terrible situation. Of course, now it's not a, a good defense for it to continue. So what I ask families to do is to raise doubts in their loved one's mind um, that they're not going to see immediately working on them. Um, I uh, uh, Several years ago, I worked with a woman who was involved with a particularly vicious cult in Connecticut. Um, a cult leader who claimed to be a reincarnation of Jesus. Um, and um, she uh, she was in the cult and she came to see me and um, we had a, a discussion. Two years later, she called me and she said, I want to thank you because I've left my cult. Um, because when something that you asked me, I couldn't get it out of my mind. You said to me, Jesus was a humble man is your guru a humble man? And she said, 
I couldn't get that out of my mind. And finally, I decided I, I have to leave. It was eating away at me. Now, I hadn't even remembered that I said that, but that is the kind of thing that I would say. I didn't say it because I'm brilliant. Believe me. I, have, I, I didn't know that this, you never know. You never know when the individual's got doubts and you never know when it's, something's going to hit. So all you can do is to lay things out for them, try to clear away the obstacles and hope that they reconsider on their own because it's not going to be probably something that you're, that you as a friend or a family member is going to say, that's going to get them to leave. You can just lay out the foundation for them to do their thinking on their own. Which goes to the point of when we witness someone suddenly distancing themselves, cutting all ties, dropping their favorite activities, just doing a complete turnaround from their previous life. As humans, we, we, we're hurt, right? We, we want to say, oh, they don't want to have anything to do with us anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with them either. And that is probably one of the worst things we could do. Am I, am I correct? Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that it's important for, for people to realize if they witness this kind of thing is to try to be that person that asks those gentle questions to help reactivate that critical thinking in the person being victimized so that they can see, maybe I'm not in such a great place. You want, you want as much as possible to um, bond with them in terms of what their goals are and say, I can understand that. Um, but we have this we have this idea, right? That the Alan, I've heard you speak at conferences. You talk about the 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 uh, myth of the unmalleable mind, right? Yes. You want to speak to that concept of what that means? Like, why is it so hard? I, I've heard the word occult used tonight. I've heard the word brainwashing used. And I know from my personal experience and advocating for attention to this issue that authority figures often, once they hear those two words, they just tune out. They think we're talking about science fiction or we're anti-religion or we're crazies. Um, be because as you've said, Alan, there is no legal definition of brainwashing. So it's very hard to, to move on with this. So explain that, the myth of the unmalleable mind and why that's pertinent to tonight's discussion. I think that it's very difficult for people to understand how easy it is to manipulate people mentally because they feel that they can't be manipulated themselves. Until it happens, you don't think it will happen to you. And then the people to whom it happens, you think, well, there must be some weakness there. They're not strong or they're, I'm not hearing the whole story. Um, you know, there's, they're just looking for excuses and so on. Um, and so the myth of the unmalleable mind is really a form of self-deception protection. Um, the idea that, well, other people are weaker and it's going to happen to them, uh, but it's certainly not going to happen to me. Uh, and it just seemed to me that more and more as I encountered people and told stories about the the people I was working with and and um trying to protect in the courts that i would hear something that sounded like well it wouldn't happen to me and so it seemed to me it's a myth to think that you have an unmalleable mind you just haven't met the right malleator <laughs> <laughs> lucky for you right <laughs> but again we have this concept it's ingrained in us that we all instantly turn into adults once once we hit 18 um, but yet we know from, from scientific research on, on the brain that our brains don't fully mature until we're closer to 25, 26 years old. I'd be interested in hearing from Wendy and, uh, Emily and Rita, um, were, how do you, how did, how did you explain that? Well, again, the, the perception is, is that people, you know, it's two consenting adults, so whatever they do, it's fine. So how did how do you rectify that or talk about that now with the people you work with when you advocate against human trafficking to explain that this is not a consensual relationship that something else is going on? Uh, Emily, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. This 
it's probably one of the hardest things for when you're working with individuals still involved in relationships with traffickers um, or anyone who's exploitive because of how they control your interactions and those relational dynamics. So even getting someone to understand and see um, what's going on, it's again, I think it's been mentioned here, seeing what their goals are really. And when you're working with someone, it's being strengths-based and client-centered. You're working with where they're at and what they're working toward. Um, in situations where it is more of like children, again, like with me, where the family is the cult, uh, really the intervention really didn't happen for me until I was able to leave. And for a lot of people I see that is time and separation away from those individuals where, and coming out of survival. And that's a long process that needs a lot of support. Mm -hmm. Lindsay or Rita, did you wanna to speak to that issue of the um, consenting adult? dynamic. I think that from what I've seen with women I've worked at, at a shelter, they don't even know they're being trafficked. And if they are being trafficked, they blame themselves because they're traffic. I'm talking about sex trafficking um, because the trafficker gets them hooked on drugs and then they're doing survival sex to have the drugs. So they blame themselves because the trafficker pounded that in their heads. Same thing, same thing for me as a child from three to 13. It was my fault because I was too pretty and men couldn't help themselves. And when we talk about cults, Bill, people sometimes assume that that means like a large organized group, right? We, there are such thing as one-on-one -on -one cultic relationships. Would you like to address that point? One of the subcategories of, of cults is something we call one-on-one -on -one in which, which is, closer to what we're talking about mostly today, where one individual um, melts in with another person um, and uh, becomes, uh, feels that they owe their identity uh, and, and their happiness to that person. When, when, when we're children, we, we don't start out with a mind that's, that's a Volkswagen and then we trade that in for a mind that's a Buick. And then we trade that in, am I dating myself, for a mind that's a, <laughs> um, a Cadillac. And then we trade that in for a bus. What happens is we, we start out with that Volkswagen, if you will, and then we build on to that. And we keep, and we, as our mind, as we mature, our minds keeps, we become more and more sophisticated in the way we think. But that Volkswagen is still there and it can still be activated. That's why um, for everybody, when, when our boss calls us in and says we want to talk to us, we think, oh my God, like I'm going to the principal's office because the first time we experience a traumatic event, an event that, that we haven't experienced before, it's imprinted in our minds. And every time we re-experience something that's similar to that, it reminds us unconsciously of that original traumatic event. So that's, I'm addressing what Alan said about how it, it could happen to any of us. All of us have that vulnerability under the right set of circumstances. Marianne, can I jump in here? Sure, sure. Um, just going back to the previous question, and then I want to address this question. No, 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 it's good. It. Thank you. But um, the previous question about what, what can somebody do? And I can tell you that, like, I remember the very first time I was shown respect. It was actually by a nurse practitioner in a doctor's office. And she, she showed me respect. And it was like, oh, does, is this? what somebody respecting me feels like. And it, even while getting out, my journey out of that situation, it wasn't until I was able to feel what real love 
and friendship and caring was that I was able to start letting go of all of the fake, you know, love. The second factor about the brain, I'll give you an example in my story. Um, when I was released from prison, so I went from my trafficking experience into prison, and then I was released. And so I was 31 years old, and I got a schoolyard crush on my parole officer. I acted like a 15-year-old girl. I was watching him. I mean, I was just, I was so in love and just all the butterflies. And finally, when the, you know, kind of all came out, my pro officer said, Wendy, did you ever have the opportunity in high school? Did you ever have the experience of having a crush on one of your teachers? And I said, no, I dropped out of school in the ninth grade. And he said, that's all this is. He said, you are having the experience of a 15 year old, but now, and I've noticed, I have observed myself throughout the years, I've had to catch up. You know, even when I got out of the situation at 31, it was, my brain was still, my brain never developed like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and even today, there are times that, you know, it's like, okay, I'm learning and processing information like a 40-year-old instead of a 50-year-old. Thank you, Rita. <laughs> you know, just because I have not caught up and, you know, and I'll probably will never cut, catch up, but yeah, just wanted to share that. No, that's a very important point. Um, that's what happens. People's uh, childhood, childhoods are robbed of them, their teenage, their formative years are stifled in many ways and and they they develop feelings and habits that they should have developed earlier on much later in life it's like a regression you know they're just like stifled for so many years because of the alienating and coercive um influence um you mentioned having gone to prison i appreciate your candor and, and i appreciate the fact that all three of our lived experience um, experts are being so open tonight with our um, uh, audience. Uh, it takes a lot of courage and uh, determination. So thank you for that. Um, but it's sad that only if a prosecutable crime is committed will authorities, law enforcement step in and, and sometimes only after irreparable harm has been done. So in the absence of a law against coercive control, against predatory alienation, how would you all like to see law enforcement respond when they're called in on a case? Let's say someone says, something strange is going on. I know that this is not right. Please help. Rita, you want to start? Yes. Stop blaming the person who called for help because so many times the person that called for help, oh, they were sleeping around. They were selling themselves for sex. They need to look at the person around them, the person controlling them and the police. I'm training police cadets in my county to teach them what to look for. So we need to teach our new law enforcement coming up. Excellent point. That That's, yes, Alan. That's the myth of the unmalleable mind. And also the fundamental attribution error. Is that right? Do I have that term right, Bill? Is the term when... Uh, People tend to emphasize personality-based explanations for behavior they see in others, and they, they don't pay attention to the situations around those people. So they might assume that a person's actions depend on what kind of person they are instead of what's going on in that person's we, life. We all have stereotypical thinking, and we all base our uh, immediate responses on uh, previous responses to individuals that fit a certain pattern. That's part of our survival techniques. It's part of being a human being. Mm -hmm. What we wanna do is to rise above that and recognize our prejudices and say wait a, to ourselves, wait a minute, before I make this conclusion and it fits into my neat little categories, I've gotta hear what the person's saying. Um, I love the, what Rita said. We, don't blame the victim. And that is uh, that happens in so many areas of our lives 
in our politics and in, in so many areas of, uh, of, of human existence. I have to jump in on that one because I'm actually dealing with something right now. Okay. Exactly that. I did a, a video and um, for this organization and they had asked me questions. I really thought I was strong enough. They asked me questions that I was not comfortable with. And I said, no, I don't want to talk about that. And they kept going, oh, come on, come on, talk about it. So I went ahead and talked about it, not realizing, I know I have a laugh tick. So there I laughed through the whole entire answer. And so now all these comments are coming up. I don't believe her. There's no way that she's going to laugh about it. You know, and I remember when I first got out, I would tell my entire story laughing the entire way. I would talk about him beating us. I would talk about him stabbing us. And I would just laugh my butt off. And it took me a while. And so, yeah. And so just because a victim doesn't fit your, you know, what you think a victim is supposed to act like understand that a lot of that is just, it's subconscious. I, I had no idea I was laughing the entire time I was talking about this until the video gets published and everybody starts, look at her, she's laughing, it's not real. And I'm just like, oh God, <laughs> so yeah. Incredible. That's like a coping mechanism, right? To, to get through the, the pain of, of what you're enduring. Um, Ellen, I keep thinking that a lot of the cases that involve undue influence and predatory alienation have the, well, what, what they have in common often is a lack of informed consent. Um, could you walk us through that term and its significance to, to how it relates to, to knowing when something improper is going on? Well, that, that's a tough question because informed consent doesn't apply in these cases. You know, this is you're, well. There you're, is no informed consent. And you don't consent, right? So, so you, why? How could you, could we learn about that to teach people about informed consent and to expect it? Informed consent is a concept, um, which is a contract between a care provider and a patient um, that the patient will be told all information necessary. Uh, risks, dangers, benefits, and so forth, uh, and uh, will agree to the procedure only after having that information. So right, that but outside the medical field, don't we also have that concept that when you enter into, into, you sign up for anything, whether it's a club or a social group where, where they lay out their expectations, uh, isn't that one of the things that we should teach our young people to do is to avoid uh, just signing up for things without really knowing what they're signing up for, because they don't know what they're going to get into. Well, that that's that's certainly true. Okay, maybe um, I use the wrong term. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be informed consent. Certainly not in the law of torts, which is civil wrongs. Okay, it's part of medical malpractice or psychiatric. Okay, and corrected. So you know far better than I do about these things. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, but it. Correct me if I'm wrong, a tenant of law is that where there's a harm, there should be a remedy. Is that correct? In theory. In theory. Okay. Yes. So what needs to happen for lawmakers to address course of control? I mean, clearly there is harm. How do we remedy that? And, and not worry so much about the situation in which it's taking place focus on the actions of the perpetrator rather than the vulnerabilities of the victim or the, or the particular circumstances of the victim. Yeah, well, it's that that's tough because we've been working for decades, you know, and, and uh, it, my own personal history is that um, when I first learned about ICSA, the International Cultic Studies Association, um, I think it was around 1978 or 1980, something like that. Uh, and I used to go to the meetings and eventually was elected president and I'm now on the board of directors. And this is an organization which, which um, can brag about having Bill as a member. Uh, and, it was, and we're delighted to have him in every way. Um, and ICSA was baffled because they were dealing with people coming out of cults, but they couldn't get um, 
any relief for them. They couldn't hold the um, the perpetrators responsible, the cult leaders and so on, responsible, because the only tool they had was to go in and argue brainwashing. And as I said earlier, the courts did not recognize brainwashing. Well, I'm uh, glad you brought up that word, Bill, uh, Alan, because uh, Wendy had an in interesting situation where, Wendy, you want to talk about it? You unbrainwashed yourself? Well, that's how I, so I remember my mother always telling me, you know, he's got you brainwashed. He's got you brainwashed. And I was like, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. But then after getting out of prison and trying to live on my own, I realized he's still in my head. You're nothing without me. You're never going to make it in the world, real world. Nobody is ever going to love you. And I started thinking, it's like, okay, how did he brainwash me? Well, it was by saying the same thing over and over and over again. And so I said, well, why can't I brainwash myself into being what I want to be? Now, some people may take that as, oh, so who Wendy is, is in, in um, you know, this brainwashing, but no, I try to brainwash myself into the person that I would have been if all that trauma had not occurred. And so I did, I started writing down all those affirmations and you know what? They were lies to me at the beginning. At the beginning, I loved myself. I knew it was a lie. I'm a good person. I knew it was a lie, but I continued to tell. And it took about a year and a half to two years. And so finally I realized, oh my gosh, I do love myself. Oh my gosh, I am a good person. And so I basically just, I mean, that's just the, my simplistic way of doing it. It's like, okay, I brainwashed myself into being who I think I was meant to be prior to all that trauma. And so, but brainwashing is 100% real. Honestly, we can see it today. <laughs> we yep. can see it <laughs> very well. Um, so I'll, I'll shut up there. <laughs> oh, no. The term brainwashing. I to... Go ahead, Alan, I'm sorry. The term brainwashing was coined by a man named Edward Hunter. Hunter was an operative for the Central Intelligence Agency. And the concern was that um, during the Korean War, um, prisoners, American uh, prisoners of war were uh, being put on television and confessing to sins that they had committed and crimes and the United States, you know, had forced them to do this, et cetera. Uh, and so it was a propaganda effort. This is, and all, this was on American television. So Hunter and others uh, coined the term brainwashing, which came from uh, a, a Chinese fra phrase that literally meant brainwashing. Mm -hmm. the, it was, so it was at first a propaganda idea, but there is a very, and, and I, I know this by the way, because I did interview Edward Hunter um, and we had a nice talk about where it came from. But it, it, there is a scientific literature of brainwashing. Brainwashing is just a shorthand term. You know, instead of saying Federal Express, you say FedEx. So instead of saying brainwashing, you would say a, a rather long scientific um, theory that nobody wants to hear. And so judges that say there's no such thing as brainwashing know nothing. You know, they don't, it, there is a robust literature. Um, I've read the, uh, the secret CIA documents that were released uh, under uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, MK Ultra Project, Artichoke, uh, Bluebird, and so on. And there's nothing but brainwashing going on in those papers. So it became so impossible to convince a judge that brainwashing exists, that I urged ICSA to move to undue influence. Because undue influence is centuries old in law, but it had never dealt with anything other fi than fiscal uh, problems. You know, where you, you have a guardian and suddenly you, you, you die and the rule says you're leaving everything to your guardian uh, and the family gets nothing. Mm -hmm. So these are these are these are all kind of notions. The um, 
so it didn't apply to mental harm. Right. And my job was to try to find a way to make it do that. And the social influence model is certainly an important step in that in that direction. Um, that's the irony of it, isn't it? If if someone steals your teenager's backpack, you could claim, "Hey, they stole my kid's backpack. Do something about it, and the cops will come, and the wheels of justice will be set in motion." But if they take your child's mind and convince your child to do something that normally that child would never do, such as giving up their whole life. There's no remedy at this point. Yes, Rita. Um, the chat might be disabled. I think a couple of people have put in there. The chat's not working. I just thought I'd let you know. Sorry. Oh, I think Kate's taking care of that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Um, is there a question that you had wanted me to ask that I neglected to ask of any of you? Well, then if, if not, then what I'd like to do is to ask you one final question. Um, and that would be what message would you like our audience to take away tonight from your particular presentation? Um, Emily, let's start with you. Tonight, I would just like to leave, you know, with just thinking about how do we broaden the understanding of predatory alienation to include familiar trafficking cases, also where families are the cult structures, mm -hmm. fundamentalistic groups where children are raised up in these structures, mm -hmm. and how we can start to think about being more inclusive that way. Um, and really just again, that it, it's similar in so many ways to other situations, but it has its own particularity. So we have to think of, about how Thank you. And Bill, how about you? I guess the, the main thing is something that, that I've heard from, from everybody here, which is not to blame the victim. Uh, we, I think uh, we have a tendency when we hear something really awful and, and it really skeeves us out, to to defend against us and say that couldn't happen to me or that couldn't happen to my loved one because they're too smart or they got too much going for them or they're too skeptical or uh, they, they're too educated or, or whatever and it's a means of othering people that are victimized and it's some it's something that all of us do um because something is so frightening. And when we think of people being uh, coerced to um, do things that they wouldn't normally have done if it, the circumstances had been different, it's so much easier for us to say there must be a fundamental flaw in them uh, rather than to recognize that, as Alan said, any of us under the right set of circumstances could be... Uh, made to do things that they, we wouldn't normally do. And, and I emphasize under the right set of circumstances, we could come up with scenarios um, where people could do some things that are pretty terrible because they didn't recognize that they had choices. So that's the main thing, don't blame the victim. Thank you, Bill. And Wendy, your final takeaway? I would say, I would ask each person that to, with an open heart, to seek first to understand. And that means truly to understand. I don't think Bill was sex trafficked, but I can tell you he understands. He understands because of the things that he said. So if you are having these doubts, if you're having these, oh, I think she's like, then you don't understand yet. So seek first to understand and, you know, just have more compassion um, for others. That's a beautiful, thank you, Wendy. Rita? So for me, it's a matter of education. If we and to, to know what predatory behavior is, we have to learn to recognize that every person should see the de definition of what predatory behavior or human trafficking is so when they're ready and safe, they can get the proper help to heal. Excellent. That's very practical. 
And Alan? Uh, somebody a long time ago said, we are all atoms trying to become molecules. <laughs> and I think about that quite often because every one of you people who may scoff at this, you're an atom. And you may become a molecule and you may not know the other atom you bonded with. So just as a matter of self uh, protection, and someone else said something that I think is very important, and that is minds are like parachutes. They only function when they're open. Right. But not so open that your brains fall out, right? That's the other half of that saying. <laughs> Of course, you have to want a functioning mind. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We've had a lot of very serious discussions with a lot of candor and honesty and sincerity and intellect. And I really can't thank you all enough for participating. Thank you to our panelists, every single one of you, um, for sharing your expertise and knowledge and emotion with our audience tonight. Um, before we sign off, I'd just like to encourage those listening to please continue this conversation at home with those you love. Um, also, if you've witnessed predatory alienation or any other manifestation of coercive control or been subjected to it yourself, I encourage you to share your experience with your local legislators. Let them know this is an issue that you care about, one that they need to address for the safety and security of all of us. So thank you again, everyone, for your time and attention. Have a good evening. Thank you, and thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.